Hi, my name is Sebastian and in this video I'm going to show you eight tips and things I learned when using Neo4j and Neo4j OGM with Java. This comes from experience with Java and especially Quarkus in production settings and production projects. As the first thing, we should take care to define proper domain IDs or as a tip you UID otherwise. So what that means is that every entity similar to what you would define in the um, ORM mapping with Hibernate and, um, and JPA is that it needs an ID for a node entity. So this ID can be a technical ID or a domain ID. And with that, just as a tip, be aware of what you define here. Just if you're really sure that something is a domain ID, like an identifier that it is unique within your domain, maybe also um, across some users that then you can use this that's totally fair enough if not then my recommendation is to use a UUID which you can um, convert and also generate uh, using the strategy and the converter that is provided uh, by Neo4j already and then you can use that as such that you just define um, this UUID type within your entity so that's the first thing if you would like to use some other um, ID for example here for that and as always you can access the, uh, this code on github this is similar to my example that I was showing uh, before then in that case you can actually define a domain ID so for these um, coffee origins that's the country that should be unique and then from my domain I want to specify okay that actually acts as identifier so please use it as ID this is very similar to what you would do in a relational world with JPA but just be aware whether something actually is an identifier in your domain other than that you can use UUID as the next tip that is now specific to Neo4j and especially Cypher and this is something I got wrong in the beginning um, especially when you're uh, just starting out uh, with Cypher like I did be aware of the difference between match and merge this um, relates to your queries so if we try this out and that's also a very helpful tool here the Neo4j uh, browser if for example I would like to say well please merge and create some uh, node so for example, uh, merge some uh, foobar with some name. So that's going to be created. Okay. And now in the next uh, case, I want to take that node and combine it with a relationship with maybe with another node. So what then I thought just in a very naive way that I say this, for example, has some relationship uh, like some foobaz, for example, that also has a name then what you would expect now what it does and this is uh, in the be uh, beginning maybe a little bit confusing now it will actually create yet another of these uh, of this node another fuba node so it will then well if i type this correctly it will then create two nodes foobar and bass although this already exists the, so this is because you wrote the whole thing as a merge statement and what it does it tries to merge this whole structure of foobar has bass so that structure doesn't exist yet so it will create the whole structure including all well all three things including the two nodes so if we now have a look in our graph for example saying this foobar then now we get two nodes and one of that will be connected with bass and the other one won't that's the other one what we created before okay so if that is what you want then that's fine but usually if you say i would like to um, create one node and then just connect it um, with something and maybe that node already exists then what you would do you would match for the existing ones first and then merge just the structure like the uh, relationship how this looks like and for that i just want to delete that again So I want to delete these and I want to delete the bass as well. And now let's try again. So with this, I want to say um, merge, for example, so we can browse here as well. I want to merge the structure once again. So assuming that already exists. And now instead of having this uh, structure here, what I would like to do at first is I want to do a match first. So I match this um, node 
and then I say merge with that particular node already uh, being there because then I'm only gonna merge actually the structure of has and then the second node. If the second node already exists or it might exist then we need to match that as well and merge it. What you can also do if um, you're not sure that it already exists create a merge and then it will actually only create this if it doesn't exist yet and then merge this whole um, other pattern. So the safest way to do this is to say, okay, merge this one, then merge that one as B, and then say N has B. So then it only merges all of the things individually if they don't exist yet. So even if the two nodes already exist, then it will only merge this relationship. So in this case, it had to create that node and the relationship and how our graph now looks like is as follows that we only have one foobar node and the bass node, which is what we wanted to have. So just to keep this in mind in your uh, queries, be aware of that difference, how it works, especially merge. And in, in case if you know that it already exists, you can match it first and write it in individual uh, substatements which already gets us to the next tip, which is try out your stuff in the graph browser, which is this one that is really, really helpful. So that is really good to just explore the things and we can try out queries and so on. And we can also try out like smaller portions of our queries. I've been showing this in my um, videos before. So for example, if we have some more complicated structure, like some matching, yeah, that's a good one with some recommendations. So if you're interested in that, you can check out uh, my other videos about this, where we have just a bigger query right here, which does a lot of things. And in order to sort of debug this individually, it's really helpful if we just go and say, well, first of all, I would like to see what this, you know, flavor weight distribution, this calculation does. And then we basically go here and saying I can, for example, take the subquery, just uh, paste it in and then um, something like with flavor and then I can say well just return uh, this intermediate uh, flavor weight result and I hope I did everything correctly here let's just try this out and then it goes over my uh, calculation here so the weight is zero actually in this case because I haven't rated uh, some coffee but if you're interested in that again you can check out this other video in which um, I explained the recommendation for um, Neo4j. But that is just to say, can I try out some, well, um, some in between results here or use this uh, to play around and to explore what works? And yes, for that, I can really recommend to use this browser. It's very helpful. You, you can kind of interactively uh, look around and just try out your queries to make sure that they will work in your code later on. Another tip with regards to the mapping of bigger queries is that we make use of the OGM auto mapping. What that is, is as follows. If we go and write some, well, arbitrarily complex query here, for example, that ultimately should give us a specific type, for example, the coffee beans here, then what we can do, and that's kind of cool, at first it might look a little bit confusing, but basically if your query then returns, what well what type you expect and not only the type but basically all of the relationships of that type then that automatically will be mapped from OGM if these types match how that looks like is as follows that we have our entity here our coffee bean and as you can see we have specific relationships here and if you want also the other Java objects then to be populated then you can do so by including them into your query and then ultimately your resulting coffee bean will already have these things being populated. You can try this out quite quickly if you use something like a development mode or a debug mode. But uh, the good thing is if we just can rely here on the OGM mapping, if we return these things in our query, like um, as all of these uh, specific uh, relationships and notes, for example, tastes, flavor, you know, you have to be sure to well, collect them accordingly, that they, um, that they appear in every single row. Yet another thing that you can try out quite nicely in the browser. And then they will be mapped automatically by your OGM framework, which is really helpful. As another tip or recommendation, for some bigger changes in your graph or for some refactorings, have a look at this APOC library. 
that comes with Neo4j or actually depending on how you run your database can be included automatically and this APOC stands for awesome procedures on Cypher and for that they include a lot of things already especially with regards to refactoring you can check out the documentation and the list here for example apoc.refactor and so on and so forth so for example if you want to rename something a node type like a label or a relationship uh, type or any other things this is really helpful for production applications that we say we know what our graph schema looks like at all times and we can write some migration scripts in order to get there this is really helpful but for some specific use cases it might also be helpful to actually call this from your application code depending on what you like so for example if you're interacting with some user-defined graph and say I have specific um, business methods where I do want to change some relationship types or actually move uh, nodes around in some way it might be helpful to actually call this it does work to call this from your code and just in general so what, what we can do um, as an example is that we have something like this call that we match some specific label and actually want to rename like the whole type. So for example, if you would refactor your class or something like this, um, then you can call so um, or do so by calling this uh, specific uh, procedure. So that's how this might look like. And again, you could also call this from within your code. And then just well depends on what you would uh, like to do refactor the graph sort of the idea behind that is that at all times you just know how your graph looks like and that you can rely on that your schema stays somewhat intact also when you would like to refactor something in your application which is really helpful as well now as a next tip what we also want to consider in is some date um, and date time types especially if you use uh, well Java 8 or uh, plus so a recent Java version if you want to use the Java date time API and you typically do want to use they are supported out of the box by Neo4j OGM which is really nice so with this uh, regard you just have to include um, all of these properties like literally as a property I don't have one here in the example uh, but in some other code where you just include a property of local date or zone date time or something like this that then will be mapped and will work automatically with the converters being included out of the box which is really helpful you just have to make sure that you know what is basically uh, being included here so for example um, if you say um, I want to merge some time node something like this and I would like to include uh, for example a time there are specific functions for that that you can also have a look uh, here in the temporal uh, functions basically that then show you what is supported um, well uh, out of the box and then how they also map so for example we have this date time function that just either maps a date time or includes the current a date time that then you can check out in let's say some time node here in uh, the graph of course or here with your properties that then you can see what that looks like so this is one thing again they map out of the box uh, from OGM so you can just create them as such one recommendation here is also that you keep these actual types in your graph in mind what that is you can try this out with um, schema um, note type properties by calling this uh, procedure and then it will tell you from your whole graph what the types of your individual properties are and then you see that we have this date time uh, type here for that particular property you just want to make sure that this stays consistent so depending on how your OGM maps this for your particular class and depending on how you use your queries so that this just matches all of the time for that you can just try out how this uh, works out of the box and then have a look at the types uh, that are being created here and that your queries that interact with them just keep this in mind as well as a next tip have your users or multi-tenancy quote-unquote in mind that that doesn't mean or doesn't have to mean actual multi-tenancy just in case if your users interact with the graph simultaneously or in a way that if you say well 
ideally every user had their own graph that is just isolated then you need to keep this in mind how to basically either isolate them or where to define the cases where you do want some connections with regards to recommendations across users for example so you just need to keep this in mind especially how these things isolate or not and then especially when it comes to constraints or any other um, assumptions that are there in your graph that you don't get any inconsistencies as always it really helps if you have some sort of queries that just give you an idea if there are some sort of inconsistencies for example if um, some graph nodes from multiple users where however you map the the user definition of different nodes uh, for example as a specific label or as some extra property or as some extra node um, whether there are some inconsistencies that you would not expect to at least see them in your production data setup. So just have that in mind how you want to map specific uh, users and their data if that is a case in your application and have them in mind ideally upfront how to map this and uh, regard in your graph. As a next tip and that's also the last one of our eight uh, tips Related to that, what we just uh, heard, have your production schema and indexes in mind. So how actually your production data looks like. With indexes and with especially with constraints, depending on which version of Neo4j you're using, the enterprise version um, supports um, these node keys that are actual primary keys, also on a database level, that then would um, give you an error if you try to have multiple one of these, if you violate that constraint that you just know how your actual data looks like. So for example, if you violate some of these implicit constraints that actually haven't been set, for example, within the set of one user, I have specific constraints that one node needs to be unique or something like that, that not only or not necessarily do you throw an error immediately, but just that you get awareness of that. Also how your graph evolves over time. That basically or usually then can detect some bugs. So for example, if your application does something just in a way that you didn't expect, that at least you get the awareness of it that once in a while, such as you know, every other week, you can run just some consistency check queries across your domain model when you say, okay, what actually does make sense? It's similar to what we just saw with regards to the types here that you just know, okay, all of these types are in a specific way. These are the labels that I have. These are the label um, constraints that I have. And also if there are certain paths that you wouldn't expect. With that, you can just first of all, explore your graph in the browser like we saw. And then also if you get an idea how that ideally should look like, just write some queries that it can run um, over a production setting, not specifically in production, but you know, on a backup or something like this, where you just get a feeling how this looks like. Again, that's also related to the topic of migrations, which I believe it makes a lot of sense for applications to just have these migrations in a way that you always know what your schema looks like similar to what we had in a relational world where this is actually enforced sort of by your um, by your database here with the graph you're more flexible but i would really recommend in a production application that you know what your graph schema looks like at all times so these were my eight tips and findings that i learned over time when using ogm and neo4j with java I hope that was helpful. You can write into the comments uh, which one you found most helpful or maybe some other tips if you have been using uh, Neo4j with Java. And if this was helpful, I would really appreciate if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel. And thanks a lot for watching. Bye.